Okay, here we are. Let me see. All right, good. Um, so yeah, thank you for making the time. It's been about almost a year and it looks like things have not gotten much better since the last time that we've talked, unfortunately. Well, this is unusual. I've, it's gotten so intense that I've had to cancel all personal discussions. Wow. Yeah. But this is probably the last one. It's incredible. Um, so, well, uh, I'm all the more honored that you've managed to make the time to talk with me. Thank you. Um, if it's okay, I wanted to just start with, well, it's not necessarily light statement, but I took out the statement from the Russell Einstein Manifesto. Um, and that's the one that Linus Pauling liked particularly. And I think it's incredibly well put. I'll just quote. And that is, there lies before us, if we choose, <clears throat> continual progress in happiness, knowledge, and wisdom. Shall we instead choose death because we cannot forget our quarrels? We appeal as human beings to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to a new paradise. If you cannot, there lies before you the risk of universal death. So maybe just to get started, can you comment on what do you think? How close are we to universal death and what can we do at this stage to avoid it? We're very, we're approaching it. Can't give a number, but we're moving in that direction in a frightening way. We can do a lot and we're not doing it. There's almost universal agreement within the mainstream establishment, political class, that we should race towards universal death. They don't put it that way, but that's their policies. So take uh, official US policy on Ukraine. Uh, we should prolong the war so as to kill Russians, to harm Russians. Uh, read uh, people in the Atlantic Council and Applebaum. No negotiations. We have to make sure that the Russians are really harmed. That's what counts. So let's just keep the war going. Well, keep the war going means uh, kill plenty of Ukrainians, uh, starve people to death, millions of people all over the world, uh, move up the escalatory ladder to terminal war. I mean, it's easy to see how this could happen. So just a day or two ago, the United States announced that it's sending anti -sh advanced anti-ship missiles to uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, the justification is to end the Russian blockade of ports which in fact is starving people all over the world. So we'll end it by sending anti-ship missiles. Uh, Ukraine minister added that this will enable us to destroy the Russian Navy. Okay, suppose you destroy the Russian Navy. What happens then? Do the Russians say, okay, we'll use canoes from now on? Or do they use the weapons that of course they have to devastate Ukraine to start acting, attacking supply lines, which they haven't done yet, putting them into confrontation with NATO. Then we move step by step to what Russell and Einstein were talking about, terminal war. Back in their days, it wasn't that clear how severe it would be. Now we know it means terminal war, a country major countries that engage in nuclear war, they're both finished and everyone else too. The first strike will kill the attacking country. So, and that's policy, that's universal policy. And there's more to it. Let's increase the use of fossil fuels. Biden just opened new areas of exploit exploitation because we have to do it to ensure that uh, uh, Europe doesn't uh, get oil and gas from Russia. So let's increase the use of fossil fuels, which are driving us to imminent destruction. You can read the 
IPCC report the same day as Biden's announcement of opening up new fields to exploit. IPC says, look, you can, you've got to stop using fossil fuels right now, certain percentage every year, terminating them in a couple of decades. Meanwhile, the US is saying, let's expand fossil fuel production. So let's race to destruction as quickly as we can. Okay, that's the political class. And who benefits at this point? Or is it just that people don't know how to change course? Do they lack the wisdom? Do they lack the resources? Do they lack the willpower? Who is making the decisions? Well, plenty of people benefit. You go to the uh, executive offices of uh, ExxonMobil, they're just euphoric. Uh, they've got these annoying environmentalists out of their hair. Now people are lauding them for racing to destruction as quickly as possible. Lockheed Martin, delighted. They're going to get huge amounts of taxpayer money uh, to keep uh, destroying money that we need for other things. Or you can look at the intellectuals. So today in the Guardian, for example, there's an article by uh, Zizek saying, we can't accept Russian red lines. We have to stand up on principle and establish our own red lines. And then we'll stand up for those. We don't care what the Russians say. What are our red lines? Putin commits suicide. That's our red line. We're gonna stand up for that. It takes five seconds to realize that what he's saying is let's kill plenty of Ukrainians, let's cause massive starvation all over the world, let's lead the nu go on to nuclear war, because then we can feel satisfied that we've stood up for our principles. I mean, it's amazing that this can be contemplated, let alone that can be published. That's yes. the intellectual class. And let alone it becomes the mainstream thinking almost. Right, it's at this point. Um, and that brings me actually to a question asked by somebody called David. So I've put together a few questions. I tried to get questions from different people from different countries to make it a little more diverse. Here's a good question that fits right into what you just said from David. And the question is, what are in your opinion, the conditions, if any, which would allow the West to peacefully coexist with strong and flourishing Russia? Or is the idea of such Russia and the idea of the West coexisting with it peacefully, mutually exclusive? And notice it's mutual. What could convince Russia to exist with a peaceful West? Okay, it's both ways. The basic outlines are well understood. It goes right back through the whole Cold War. Uh, you look through the whole Cold War period, there were basically two conceptions of the role of Europe in the international arena. Uh, one conception is what's called the Atlanticist program embodied in NATO. Europe should be incorporated within NATO where the US makes the rules. So US should run Europe. Europe should Europe should be a subordinate to the United States. That's one vision, the one that's been implemented. Uh, there was another one. Uh, Charles de Gaulle was the most famous exponent. Uh, there should be what he called uh, independent Europe from um, his terminology from the Atlantic to the Urals with no military alliances. In Germany, this was called Ostpolitik. Willy Brandt and later German statesmen moved towards a common steps towards accommodation with Russia. After the fall of also, right? After the fall of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev came out with an even stronger position, called it a European common home from Lisbon to Vladivostok with no military alliances. Actually, that wasn't too far from what the first Bush, H.W. Mm -hmm. Bush proposed. He proposed what came to be called a partnership for peace, 
in which all the countries of this region could participate didn't eliminate NATO, but sort of put it into the background. You could be part of the partnership without being a member of NATO. Well, that was when Clinton came into office. He at first lived with that, but very quickly by 1994, uh, I'm quoting one of the high level US ambassadors now, Jess Friedman, uh, NATO Clinton started talking with both sides of his mouth to Europe and Russia. He said, yeah, partnership for peace to local ethnic communities in the United States, like the Polish community. He said, don't worry, we'll incorporate you within NATO in violation of firm, explicit promises by the first Bush not to expand NATO to the East. Huh. You will violate that, don't worry. By 1997, Clinton was saying that to his good friend Yeltsin, he was telling Yeltsin, look, don't stand in our way. We're going to expand NATO in violation of promises to Gorbachev, but I just have to do it for the domestic vote. I need the Polish vote, the uh, remaining vote for the next election. So just keep quiet about it, it won't mean much. And then he went ahead and invited the Visegrad countries into NATO. George W. Bush, second Bush, came along, opened the doors, invited all of Eastern Europe into NATO, even invited Ukraine into NATO. Uh, every US official, high level US official, head of the CIA, uh, uh, hawks like Paul Nitze, uh, you know, George Kennan famously, uh, they all understood that Ukraine and Georgia are red lines for Russia. They won't make much of a fuss about the others, but Georgia and Ukraine and the Russian geostrategic heartland, uh, members of a hostile military alliance, they can't tolerate that. That's pre-Putin, it's Gorbachev, it's everybody. And the United States went ahead, overruling the warnings from their own high level officials. Uh, well, we can go on, but that's how we got to the point where we are now, it makes, gets worse later. The, in fact, uh, in March, the State Department conceded that in the dealings with Russia, they had not considered any Russian security concerns. That's the State Department, okay, well, doesn't justify the aggression, which is of course a criminal act, like the US invasion of Iraq, but it tells you something about the background. Yes. It can't be discussed in the United States. We are moving towards a totalitarian culture where certain things simply cannot be mentioned. I've never seen anything like it in my life. There's been Horrific. plenty of repression before, but it's now verging on pure totalitarianism. You cannot talk about things that deviate from the party line. You cannot even report official US policy. Of course, the Russians know about it. They can read the government of the White House web page, but the US press can't. It's uh, fascinating <laughs> in a horrible way fascinating and it what makes it worse you know i grew up in the soviet union and of course propaganda was everywhere but people knew what it was and people took it with a grain of salt that was size of a mount everest and here they don't here it seems like they either are yet to wake up to it or they are awake to it and aware of it but just don't know what to say what do you think well, there are plenty, I mean, you can tell me more than I can, but there were plenty of people in Russia who, if something appeared in Pravda, they just took it for granted the opposite is the case. Pretty much. And in fact, there were some studies back in the 70s, I don't know what you think about these, in Russian research centers, which tried to figure out how Russians are getting their news. Turned yeah. out from the study that most of them were getting their news from BBC. Yeah. They didn't bother reading the Russian stuff because obviously all lies. <laughs> yeah. 
And now, I mean, what really, you know, for the, the first time, I think that something went on in my head was when I saw Larry King discussing whatever it is that he was discussing on RT and not on CNN. And I said, that looks like my grandparents telling me, well, you know, if you want to understand what's going on in the Soviet Union, you don't even bother reading this stuff. And so it is quite, a, it was quite a revelation. Um, the question is, and so here is a question that I got from Giora from Singapore who asked me, uh, so he says that in his observation, Western mass media in different countries appear to adopt a similar anti-Russian position on diverse questions and in different situations. What's your view on how Western mass media are regulated so efficiently and effectively? I don't think they're regulated. It's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, the Western mass media, meaning Europe, uh, are highly uh, follow the US party line very strictly. Uh, and US and culture in Western Europe is even more extreme in many ways than the United States. I mean, I have in Italy, a friend of mine who teaches in an Italian university just wrote me that a, a course on Dostoevsky was canceled. Yeah, that's insanity. I mean, it's insane, you know. Yeah. But uh, there is a difference. I can see it myself, my own experience. So I can talk on mass media in Europe can be interviewed by state television, radio, and so on. In the United States, impossible, impossible, unthinkable. Uh, no distant voice can even, you know, major leading figures like Ambassador Freeman, who I mentioned, he can appear on some marginal website, you know, somewhere, but couldn't possibly be quoted in the mainstream. Uh, Anatol Yevin, who's probably the main scholar who deals with the... Yeah, you mentioned this name and this framework. Maybe you can tell more about it. That would be quite interesting, actually. Well, I mean, an interesting question is how it's, how the European intelligentsia are internalizing this subordination to the United States. It's quite striking. It's not total. So for example, if you take today, there is a split between NATO, inside NATO, as to how to deal with the Ukraine problem. Uh, Germany, France, and Italy are openly calling for moving towards some kind of negotiated diplomatic settlement. The United States and Britain are strongly opposing it. Mm. Now that doesn't get reported in the United States, but you can find out about it. Uh, so there's a very good website, antiwar.com, basically libertarian, who publishes very reliable, uh, detailed information on things like this, which are blocked from the US media. Mm. So you can find out about it, but who, who knows? Population doesn't know. Yes, um, and um, okay. So here is another thing that I have found that I thought was really interesting. And that comes from, actually, I think I feel more people need to read world history to get a better sense of the longer term uh, the trajectories. And one of the things that I thought was interesting came from a, a series of books by Stephen Runciman that I read on the history of the Crusades, where he was lamenting the fall of Constantinople. And what he said was, quote, the real disaster of the Crusades was the inability of Western Christendom to comprehend Byzantium. Throughout the ages, there have always been hopeful politicians who believed that if only the peoples of the world could come together, they would love and understand each other. It is a tragic delusion. And it's interesting to think about it. And so it makes me wonder, are, is the world too interconnected? Are we witnessing yet another collapse of the proverbial Tower of Babel? Is that how bad things are? What do you think? Well, we happen to be at a pretty bad moment. It's not the whole world, incidentally. 
if you go to the global south, which is after all, most of the world, it's much more reasonable discussions. Uh, if I wanna know what the Russian official position is, which is after all worth knowing, mm -hmm. but to know what Lavrov foreign minister is saying, can't read it in the American press, but I can read it in the press in India. Yes, you know, isn't that remarkable? In the, in the Arab world, you know, mm -hmm. but because they're open and they're not lining up. If you look at sanctions, the sanctions map is very instructive. It's the United States, uh, the English speaking countries, Europe, Japan, but uh, not the rest of the world. They don't want to have anything to do with this. They, yeah. con they condemn the invasion as criminal, but their re basic reaction is, what are you guys so upset about? This is what you do to us all the time. So we're not going to line up with you. Yes. So, yeah, I can see that. And it's this whole double standard issue, right? I mean, if you imagine, let's say, Russians and Chinese and throw in the Arabs and maybe Venezuelans just for fun and have them form an alliance, flip the Mexican government and start building their bases there, Americans won't like it. I'm sure they will have a very strong response, right? Not only don't like it, we'd vaporize them. Yeah. But, and... uh, I mean, you know, just imagine that Mexico joined a hostile military alliance run by Beijing, yeah. which was sending weapons into Mexico, running military operations with the Mexican army, uh, training Mexican officers and how to send whip, use weapons aimed at the United States. I mean, it, it's just unthinkable. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but when we do it, it's okay. Yeah, it's sort of, I remember your uh, insightful commentary on the difference between terrorism and war on terror. I think it was. Actually, I, I, there's an interesting example of this, just a particular case, which is quite instructive. I, uh, if you read the US commentary on Ukraine now, it's almost obligatory to call it the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Well, I did a Google search and in about 30 seconds, you get about two and a half million hits for the phrase unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Then I did it for Iraq, unprovoked invasion of Iraq basically nothing, uh -huh. a handful of cases, which are all from marginal people who uh, oppose the invasion. That's it. Surprise, surprise. And, and what's particularly interesting is the facts are exactly the opposite. The invasion of Iraq was totally unprovoked. Yes. Nothing. Invasion of Ukraine, which is of course criminal aggression, was certainly provoked. We've just talked about it. But in a real totalitarian culture, you have to invert it and nobody notices. Yeah, that's the scary thing. It's one thing if, you know, under Stalin, where, <laughs> I mean, my grandfather's stepdad spent 10 years in Gulag, so I've heard some stories in my family, you know, and people would walk around singing songs like, I don't know another country where a human being can breathe so freely, right? And that was under Stalin. But at least my feeling is that from what I understand, I wasn't there to witness it, but people did not really believe it. Or maybe they did and I just don't know it. But it seems like, how do you invert things and in a way that people believe it? That's a scary thing. And not just people who, uh, where it gets really scary is when people at the sort of top, quote unquote, intellectual level believe it. Unfortunately, that's a pattern that goes far back in history. Actually, one of the most striking cases and worth thinking about is the First World War. That's far enough back so we can at least begin to think about it rationally. Uh, by now, almost any, everyone, every knowledgeable person agrees the war was totally crazy. 
There was no reason to fight it or prolong it. Not at the time. At the time in every country, Germany, England, France, United States, when it got into the war, in every country, the intellectual class was almost universally and enthusiastically lined up in support of their own country and <laughs> providing explanations that we're the most marvelous country, so of course we should win. There were a couple of dissidents. One of them was Bertrand Russell. Yes. Ended up in jail. Yes. In Germany, uh, Rosa Luxemburg in jail. You know, Russell was in jail. I know he got fired from Cambridge. I didn't know he was in jail. He was in jail. I mean, it wasn't terrible conditions, mm -hmm. but he was imprisoned in rather pleasant conditions, but imprisoned for opposing the war. Mm -hmm. Eugene Debs, prisoned. I didn't know that. There was a Luxembourg called Liebknecht. Uh, anybody who told what we now regard as the truth ended up in prison. Yes, <laughs> well, something to look forward to, I guess. Um, here's a question that I have from Julie from France, and it's a long question, I'll condense it. Violence seems to be a drug to her, it seems like. It's almost like a drug that people get addicted to violence. What can we do to stop it? Do we need something stronger than ourselves? How do we even approach it? It's an old question. It's been around for a couple of thousand years. Nobody's come up with an answer yet. Uh, actually, I think there are some positive signs. So for example, the kinds of violence that were tolerated in the not very distant past would be inconceivable today. Um, take say England, uh, relatively civilized society. Just look back at punishment in England a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. You can't even imagine it. Nothing that sadistic could even be imagined. But it was, you know, public, people cheering, and so on. But take a country like Norway. Norway has probably the most civilized criminal justice system in the world, as far as I know. It's really quite remarkable. You go back to the 19th century, uh, Norway didn't even have jails, because if, uh, if you th it wasn't necessary, you thought somebody stole something from a store, you drive a spike through their hand. Who needs a jail? You know? yeah. Well, okay, that's progress, serious progress. And uh, same is true of other things. I mean, take a look at the New York Times today, and yesterday, last couple of days, quite interesting. They're running a major series highlighted on what has been done, the torture of Haiti for two centuries. France is the main villain. The United States is the secondary villain. Haiti has been turned into the most miserable, poorest country in the world to punish it for having dared to free itself to have become the first free country of free men in the Western Hemisphere. Can't get away with it. They've been punished bitterly for centuries. In France, they refuse even to think about it. They're the main villain. The United States, almost nothing. You look at the history books, it's all lies. Uh, but they finally, the New York Times is lifting the veil slightly, substantially. Well, that's uh, that's progress. A couple of months ago, I guess by now about a year ago, the Times ran the 1619 project. That was a real breakthrough. Uh, they it was telling, talking about American history from the point of view of the slaves. 1619 is when the first slaves were officially brought. Crucial part of American history. Uh, before it was unthinkable. And of course, it's elicited a huge backlash, uh, partly among historians who say, well, you got this detail wrong, and that detail wrong, and so on and so forth. Doesn't matter. It's the first opening to the public of the basic story 
of the most vicious system in slavery of human history. It's had a lot to do with our wealth. The residue is still around us all over. Well, starting to lift a veil. By now, Republican uh, state legislatures are passing laws to ban it from being used. Yeah. Can't use it, not allowed to learn. They have a principle. The pr principle is you can't teach children things that are divisive or that make some children feel uncomfortable. In other words, you can't teach history or evolution in the books because anything in history is going to be divisive and make plenty of people uncomfortable. So what do you think? Do it. That's moving to what you grew up with, true Stalinism, yeah. ban and burn the books. Well, that's what we're moving towards. In November, when the Republicans probably take over, this will be accelerated. We're moving straight towards a Stalinist culture in a remarkable way. Yes, well, that does not sound very promising. Um, I have a couple more questions. Well, that... what is promising is that it's happening. That that um, should have made that point more strongly. The fact that the Times published the 1619 project, that it's right now mm. publishing the Haiti thing, that's a kind of a promising answer to the question that was raised. We yeah. can become more civilized. And it's happened. I mean, take the United States. You go back to the 1950s and 60s. Things that were taken for granted then wouldn't even be minimally tolerated today. I mean, the 1950s, 60s, uh, how federal housing was segregated by law. When yeah. federal housing was built, no blacks. That was by law. The United States had anti-miscegenation laws, which were so extreme the Nazis wouldn't accept them. One drop of blood, too much for the Nazis. In fact, take the status of women. Women were not legally uh, granted the rights of peers, persons, till 1975. Until yeah. then, Wow. Under the law, women were still what the founders established, property. Huh. Founding documents took over British common law. Britain, uh, women are property, property of the father handed over to the husband. Well, of course, it's been eaten away over time, but it literally wasn't until 1975 that Supreme Court made an explicit decision about it. Things have changed, not by act, not by magic, by a lot of hard work. Yes, uh, in that sense, I guess the Soviet Union may have been ahead on that thing because there, um, already a hundred years ago, there was much more parity between men and women. I think that was, they had other things that were very problematic and the Soviet Union collapsed for a reason, but that one, I think they got right. Um, no. So yeah, it's never quite as black and white as people like to paint it. And so here's something that I have, you know, out of misery watching how the world is developing, I've become a bit of a hobby historian. And so I was reading on, uh, you know, the Arab empire emerging and what was the background against it has emerged. And it's quite interesting to look at what was happening at that time in the 600s. You know, the Byzant Byzantines were fighting the Sassanids, the Persians, and they were, you know, exhausting each other and continued to fight and to fight and to fight until they came to a truce. And, but at that point, the Persian emperor Khosros was killed. Uh, the, I think the Byzantine emperor was Heraclius. He survived, but barely. And so they were completely exhausted. And against that background, the Arabs came out of the desert and essentially knocked out both empires. And so it's interesting to see how now, you know, the US and Russia, they're wrestling and wrestling and exhausting each other. And one might wonder, is this gonna be the next sort of burst and who is gonna be the winner of this? And one of my friends, Georges from Belgium, um, 
wrote me a question along those lines that is why are the us getting so heavily involved in a conflict with russia when the major strategic rival for the us seems to be china that's a very interesting point that's what the far right is saying you look at tucker carlson on fox tv says why should we wasting time on ukraine when we have to start fighting china interesting question why do we have to start fighting china that's a good question china attacking us i mean there are conflicts with china but where are they are they on the border of california or on the border of china well yeah. chinese fleets aren't uh, on the border of california the united states is aiming for a confrontation with china the official policy set up by trump extended by biden is to set up a establish a series of what are called sentinel states to uh, contain china uh, south korea japan uh, australia uh, biden is in uh, asia right now to strengthen this alliance to contain china uh, means they send advanced weapons to these states uh, on the periphery of china uh, precision weapons aimed at china uh, try to block chinese trade block chinese commercial development uh, we have to do this in fact it's kind of astonishing to see it you know the congress can pr do practically nothing because of republican opposition but there was one bill they passed the china competition bill it was a bill to develop badly needed infrastructure in the united states infrastructure is falling apart in the united states we spend so much on military that everything else is collapsing uh compared with europe it's a disaster so this bill was okay let's try to improve our backward economy but you can't say let's have a bill to improve the economy it has to be a china competition bill the cover has to be we have to out compete china not we should build bridges because we need them but we should do research because we need it no it's because we have to out compete china we have to make sure that we're first uh, we send uh, nuclear submarines to australia uh, where china doesn't has nothing even remotely comparable uh, to make sure that we control the south china sea because of chinese aggression well it's a really sick country. Why do we confront China? Yeah, that's a good it's question. Not that China is a nice place. They do rotten, horrible things, but that's not the reason we're confronting China. Yeah. You know, one thing that seems you know, along similar lines really perverse to me, but on the one hand, uh, let's say, let's take Germany, because I mean, somehow, even though I'm Russian Jewish, I have a German passport makes sense if you live in the US, right? And so the question is, so if you look into Germany, they're sending, um, they're sending uh, their weaponry to Ukraine. Meanwhile, they're paying for gas from Russia in rubles. And so it's such a strange situation. I mean, which part, it's Kafka. Well, that's why Ostpolitik made a lot of sense, moving towards an accommodation with Russia. Uh, Gorbachev's European Common Home, Bush's Partnership for Peace, all steps in the right direction. It's not ancient history. No, it's 25 could be, years. It could be restored. Uh, we have to overcome the current crisis in Ukraine. Has to be through diplomacy. Not going to be any other way. Yes. Uh, not by I mean, yes, you have to send arms for people defending themselves, but not the kind of arms that'll lead to escalation and their own destruction. Uh, that's just common sense. Uh, fortunately, the Pentagon is pretty much living up to it, not the hawks, and not the people who want to posture about uh, 
you know, we're going to sit her on the red lines. Uh, yes. Well, as they say, common sense is not that common, unfortunately. Um, one of my friends who's a war veteran, his name is Craig, he asked me, he is a big uh, fan of your film, uh, Requiem for the American Dream. He told me it really was an eye opener to him. But he had a question for you. How much of the Ukraine crisis do you believe is orchestrated by the rich of the world, the ruling elites, whatever one may call them? How much of that business, how much of that is business? Well, we, it's a good question. I mean, it's a little tricky to answer because the rich of the world have the overwhelming uh, influence on government policy. Corporate system, the super rich have an inordinate yes. influence. It's just a little hard to separate the rich from state policy. It's a point that Adam Smith emphasized. It's not new. But, yeah. Uh, but, uh, well, it's human but nature, I guess. Yeah. I mean, they're the ones who've set the policy that we've seen. Uh, the decision, I mean, if you go, it's, it's quite public. There's nothing hidden about it. Uh, after the, my, uh, first of all, uh, Clinton and the second Bush uh, openly, explicitly violated the first Bush's firm promise to Gorbachev that in return for German unification within NATO, NATO would not expand to the East. Bush lived up to it. As I mentioned, Clinton started, for political reasons at home, mostly started dismantling it. Second Bush totally threw it to the winds. Well, uh, after the Maidan uprising 2014, the United States NATO openly, proudly, in fact, started sending, to taking moves to, towards de facto integration of Ukraine within the uh, Western military system, sending weapons, uh, training, joint exercises. It was perfectly open. In fact, they're proud of it. Uh, but of course, that's in gross violation of what every American senior statesman, including the CIA directors, said is uh, violating conditions that the Russians will never accept. They'll accept uh, the Visegrad state countries entering into NATO, but not Ukraine. Uh, you just take a look at the map. There's a, from Ukraine to Moscow, it's indefensible. That's Operation Barbarossa, just yeah. flat. It's uh, inconceivable. Yes, and if you look into Russian history, I mean, people, you know, probably, I and mean, I haven't been to Russia since 94, but I have a lot of Russian friends still, and I grew up there. I can imagine what people who have learned Russian history see and feel. They say Napoleon tried it, Hitler tried it, and now some other alliance is possibly trying it. We cannot take that risk. I think they're probably seeing that. Uh, how could they? I mean, the United States has is the most secure country in history, but it would never tolerate anything remotely like it on its border. Yeah. Like if Mexico tried to join a hostile military alliance run by China, uh, Mexico would just be vaporized. Yes. That's unthinkable. You know. But Russia has a history, as you say. Second World War, 20 million Russians were killed. Russia was devastated right through Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, the German Panzer divisions went right to Kiev, you know, and then on, on to Leningrad, on to Moscow. It's, yes, uh, my grandmother's brother was killed somewhere there, you know, so I can relate, unfortunately to it. Um, yes, here is another question from Christian from Germany. Uh, I emailed you this question at some point. What do you think, what are the political mistakes that Russia has made that have contributed to the current situation? And what are the options at this point? The Russian political stupidity 
is unbelievable. I mean, quite apart from the criminal aggression, they had choices. I mean, Macron, Emmanuel Macron had made some initiatives towards Putin. Actually, Germany did too, make some initiatives to see if this is before the invasion, uh -huh. see if we can uh, work out some kind of accommodation. Well, if there had been anyone in the Kremlin who could think politically, geostrategically, they would have grasped the opportunity. Said, okay, let's see if we can work something out. Uh, instead, they just reached for the revolver, let's invade. Ending up driving Europe into Washington's pocket, uh, best gift that Washington could possibly want, and uh, severely harming themselves. I mean, from Putin's point of view, the worst outcome is strengthening NATO. Yeah. And making it all subordinate to the United States. It's exactly what he did. I mean, you talk about political mistakes. This is a colossal one, historic mistake. I mean, and there were options. You know, you could say maybe it wouldn't have worked out with Macron. Well, maybe it would have worked out. Yeah. And there wouldn't have been any invasion. There would be no expansion of NATO. Uh, you know, total, you know, apart from criminality, total absurdity. Yes. Uh, and so at this point, clearly some point of no return has been passed, obviously. But is there still something? Is diplomacy still even possible? I mean, at this point, I where think, does one go? There is. And as I mentioned, uh, Schultz, Germany, uh, Macron, Draghi in Italy have all made some overtures towards diplomacy. US and Britain are opposing it. They want to dr drag the war out. But the three major Euro European countries, Germany, France, and Italy, are still trying to move towards some kind of diplomatic settlement. There's a split within NATO about this. Uh -huh. You can't learn much about it in the United States because most of this information is just suppressed. Yes, how, how does that work? How, uh, what is the mechanism for suppressing information? How does that work? Interesting. Actually, I think uh, Orwell had the right answer in an essay that you probably never read because it was suppressed. But uh, I'm sure you read Animal Farm. Yes, my father just finished writing an opera based on Animal so Farmer. Why don't you... Uh, take a look and see if uh, they uh, looked at the introduction to Animal Farm. The introduction was suppressed. It was found 30 years later in Orwell's unpublished work. You can find it in some of the modern editions, but mostly it's rare. The introduction was addressed to the people of England. He said, look, this book is a satire about the totalitarian enemy, but you shouldn't feel so self-righteous because in free England, ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. I'm quoting him now. Mm. He gave some examples and then he gave a couple of sentences of explanation. One of them I'm quoting is uh, the press is owned by wealthy men who have every reason to have certain ideas suppressed. But beyond that, and I think more important, he said it's just the way the educated, the educational system works. Yeah. You, you go to Oxford and Cambridge, you have instilled into you the understanding. There are certain things it wouldn't do to say. You just can't think them. It's not what a gentleman thinks. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's very rigid. Then you can get somebody who's a columnist for the newspapers and he'll say correctly, nobody tells me what to write, which is correct. Because if you had any other thoughts, you'd never be there. Mm. Yes, Bertrand Russell wrote a short pamphlet on it called Free Thought and Official Propaganda. 
And he discussed it there. And I thought very eloquent as you would expect from Russell. And he actually identifies educational system, the educational system of Britain as one of the top three oppressors of freedom of thought, which I thought was quite insightful. That's pretty amazing. I mean, just take a look at what's happening now in England, which is very instructive. I mean, up until very recently, the British, or the British Empire was praised in the schools and the educational systems as a wonderful benevolent uh, enterprise, which helped everybody. Now, after hundreds of years, scholarship is beginning to unveil the hideous record of British atrocities and crimes from the very beginning. And it's actually beginning to penetrate the culture. You can read reviews in Times Literary Supplement saying, yeah, we got to think about this. It wasn't as pretty as we thought. So you wait a couple hundred years of uh, indoctrination at Oxford and Cambridge, and maybe the truth will finally emerge. Uh, well, we're the same. Yeah. I mean, uh, we don't we won't get to see that but and yeah. the worst of all probably is france yeah one of the interesting things that's it's not new that's coming out fun, being finally reported in this time, new york times series on haiti is the way france has totally concealed to themselves the hideous record of france for hundreds of years to try to destroy haiti began by imposing a huge, sending a fleet, a naval fleet to force Haiti 1825 to pay a huge indemnity to France for the crime of having liberated themselves. It was so huge, Haiti couldn't, never got out of paying it. The debt payments just increased. Uh, there was a commission in France a couple of years ago uh, Aristide, the president who France and the United States expelled from the country, yeah. them and threw him out. But he called for rethinking the question of reparations, caused a furor in France. How can anybody dare ask noble France to call to pay reparations? But they did set up a commission headed by Regis de Bray, the leftist. Uh, intellectual. They said the call for reparations is ridiculous. It's like a seven-year-old asking for a treat. That's Regis Debray, leading left intellectual. Huh. Well, all of this is finally beginning to come out after centuries of hideous <laughs> violence and terror. Okay. Takes, that's the civilized West. Yes, um, yeah, it seems like your dog sounds like has strong opinions about it also. Um, yes, I have one more question from a friend from here, California. His name is Chris. I will read it to you. He says, much of the world's conflicts appear, it's sort of aligned a little bit with what you say. Much of the world's conflicts appear to arise from absolutist thinking. We're good, they are bad, etc." On the other hand, the argument that no one individual or people is guiltless canon has been used to justify all manner of atrocities. What hope for countering absolutist thinking and its related acts and atrocities do you see when those assigned as judges against them practice all of it regularly? To whom or how should that task of judging harmful absolutist thinking related acts and or atrocities on the world stage be reassigned and who would you have to do the reassigning? It's work, gotta do it. We know how to do it, but you have to work on it. Sometimes it succeeds. Like uh, after a couple hundred years, the British are just beginning, just barely beginning to look back at their hideous record of crimes over centuries. The French haven't gotten there yet. They can't look at them. Uh, the United States uh, mixed story. Uh, you may have seen on television a couple of days ago, George W. Bush was 
making a speech about how awful the Russians are. And he made a slip of the tongue. He said, uh, uh, the criminal war against Iraq. He said, oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was quite something. How did people react? They left. I had an interview in Iraq a couple of days after that. They didn't laugh. Yeah. It's not funny. It's not funny. The United States under Bush devastated Iraq. Of course. But when we talk about it, we laugh. Well, how long will it take before we can look at that? Well, take some work. But yes. No, but I remember, and that was, I was in Germany at the time. I was in Heidelberg. I was an undergraduate student. And um, I was depressed because my girlfriend just left me. And then this horrible Iraq invasion started. So I have very, very strong memories of that time. And uh, I remember that there were protests everywhere in Germany, in France, in uh, Peru, you name it. And it didn't help. Nobody cared. They still invaded and destroyed the well, whole country. I have a slightly different opinion than almost everybody about that. I think it helped. Uh, I think what it did was constrain the means of aggression. It was yeah. horrible enough. Could have been a lot worse. Oh, okay. It wasn't about that. saturation bombing by B-52s like in uh, Vietnam, for example. And I can't prove it, but I suspect that the massive demonstrations probably restricted the uh, means of invasion. When you take away the constraints, they just do anything. Like in Vietnam, mm -hmm. where there was very little protest until the very end, it was just savage destruction. Do any, you wanna carry out saturation bombing of heavily populated areas, go ahead. Chemical warfare, fine, no problem. Took a long time before there was any protest. Well, yeah. I think the protest makes some difference. There are constraints imposed. I hadn't thought about it from that angle. I guess I am too, maybe too naive, but it's hard to imagine that Iraq could have been even worse than it was because that was just so horrific. Yeah, it was horrible. Could have been worse. Wow. Just look back at Vietnam. You can see the yeah. US didn't do massive chemical warfare, didn't do saturation bombing of heavily populated areas, didn't have, it had plenty of atrocities, but nothing remotely like Vietnam. Yeah. Or take Cambodia. I mean, take Henry Kissinger, who's honored. Take a look at his record. In 1970, uh, he transmitted an order from Nixon, probably half drunk, an order to the US Air Force, I'll quote it, massive bombing campaign in Cambodia, anything that flies against anything that moves. I don't think there's a, in the entire archival record you can't find a call for genocide like that. That's horrific. Does anybody care? Maybe someday they'll care. Hopefully. I mean, I didn't know about it, but it's horrific to hear about this and people don't talk about it. I mean, that brings back, you know, I've been wondering for a couple of years now, you know, if you look at nationalism and you look at what's going on in the world. At some point, you come to a very simple question, what is actually a country, right? And the best uh, definition that I found of a country, I think we talked about it briefly a year ago, or so um, comes from Arnold Toynbee, which is a country is an object of worship of collective human power, and therefore a religion. And so it's interesting to think about it from that angle. It almost seems like this all fits in, doesn't it? Yeah, something to it. It's, uh, and we should remember that the nation state is a pretty recent development. It uh, doesn't go back centuries. Yeah, it's a so, Western thing, right? And I think it's, uh, 
know, it has its value, but it's a, it has a pretty horrible record. Maybe we can go back to a better system, a system of accommodations with, without military alliances. That's the hope for the future. Gorbachev's common European home, for example. It's not impossible. I mean, take Europe. For centuries, the uh, highest goal of Europeans was to slaughter each other constantly. Well, since 1945, they've, Europe itself moved to some kinds of accommodation. French and the Germans aren't going to slaughter each other as they were doing for centuries. Okay, that's progress. Yeah, that's true. Well, let's hope it stays that way. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Well, thank okay. you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you again and best of luck to all of us. Yeah, be well. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.